request for direction. Uh, we have three PowerPoints to present. Uh, excuse me. Uh, one, John Fairbank from MF3. They did the poll. And the second one is uh, uh, RSG. I believe you know it from prior relationships with the city. And then the third one will be Eric. Uh, Justin, can you get the thing started and make sure? Research firm, and I'd like to try to walk through a couple of slides. This is a public opinion survey that was. Would you? Yes. Handle? No, that's fine. Okay. I'm fine. Thank you. Uh, this survey was conducted May 30th through June 5th, and feel free to ask questions, interrupt the presentation. It should be a give and take here. Uh, the methodology: we uh, completed 653 interviews. Again, they were conducted uh, pretty recently at the first part of June. Uh, these interviews were conducted, um, these are samples pulled from the voter registration files, and these are, these are voters who have consistent histories of voting in gubernatorial elections uh, over the past few years. So these are, these are likely voters for the November ballot. Uh, we did, uh, the interviews were conducted online, cell phones, landlines, to meet and match up with the demographic profiles of those likely voters in November elections, this coming November election. Margin of error is about 5% overall. This is a pretty good sample. See, I think, uh, um, I think we started out, our goal was 400 or 450, and we had a very good response online. We're at a time where, where voters uh, want to be heard uh, on, on most everything these days. And uh, so we got a very robust response from your electorate. Uh, we've also uh, had the pleasure of being your pollster for a number of years, dating back to July 2008. So I'm going to track a couple questions to give you a perspective on, on where you are now compared to uh, a number of years ago. Overall community attitudes. Right direction, wrong track. Uh, this is just kind of a general uh, optimistic, pessimistic feel about uh, uh, the direction of the city. The red is wrong track. So we're a little upside down on uh, the sense of the questions are all at the bottom of your, of your pages, if you can very small type there. Would you say that things in the city of Hemet are generally headed in the right direction, or do you feel things are off on the wrong track? Again, it's just a general, we didn't ask why. Uh, you'll probably all have a better feel for that. But 19% um, um, didn't know. You can see this is pretty consistent over the last decade. The 34 in 2008 was 34 right direction. May, it's the same. Uh, need. This is a question when we when we talk about anything that relates to financial measures placed before cities on any subject, we want to know: Do does the electorate think there's a need for additional dollars for the city? Um, here you can see we have a couple of tracks. The one to the top on the left to provide the level of city services that Hemet residents need and want. Do you think there's a great need, some need, little need, and no real need, which is in red? You can see 70%. This is a strong sense of voters clearly have a sense that you need additional dollars to um, that residents need and want. Okay, 70% is a is a good strong number. Only 15% said there were no real need. So basically, a good 80% uh, plus say there's a need for additional dollars. 
Uh, it's down a little bit from February of 2016, the last time we pulled here. But you can see, uh, and then at the bottom, another question, do you think there's a great sum, little or no real need for public safety services in Hemet specifically? You can see that's down slightly from August 15th, but again, a robust numbers. Two-thirds, uh, and if you add the 11%, little need, we're, we're pushing 80% who think there should be additional dollars for public safety, okay? Uh, generally speaking, voters are not interested in or not likely to raise money on any subject if they don't think the city needs more money. And your, your voters clearly think for public safety and general city services, there is a need for additional dollars. Uh, we, uh, as you know, this is a number of questions about uh, marijuana. So this, these are local marijuana policies. We're just trying to get uh, an understanding of where your voters are on a number of these issues. To the left-hand side, uh, as far as you know, is it illegal? Is it legal or illegal to operate a dispenser that sells marijuana for medical purposes in Hemet? 34% said it is illegal. 40% said it's legal, and 26% don't know. Okay, Lot, lots of confusion. No, no real difference from many cities. There's, we're in a statewide it's legal, but many cities like yours uh, have a ban. So this is a, uh, for, for marijuana for medical purposes. The same question was asked as it relates to on the right-hand side, as far as you know, is it legal or illegal to operate a business that sells marijuana to adults for recreational purposes? Uh, many of the questions here are going to be separating the, marijuana, the medical marijuana from the recreational. Here you can see uh, a little, a few more voters know that it is illegal for recreational purposes. Instead of the 34 on medical marijuana, it's 41. But still you have 29% say it's legal, 30%, so almost 60% are basically either don't know or have the wrong response. Okay, so this is let's go the first uh, uh, set, first set of questions that there there is going to be consistent confusion throughout on these basic two issues. Uh, I also I showed you the same question by age. There is a difference demographically here. Uh, the same question we we had just a minute ago. As far as you know, is it legal or illegal for me medical mer for medical purposes in Hemet, if you're 18 to 49, 57% thought it was legal. Okay, if you're 50 plus, which is only which is 79% of your electorate, no surprise to you, you have a, an older electorate, uh, so that's very different from the younger voters. On medical, on uh, recreational purposes, still 40% of the 18 to 49 think it's legal. Only 26% 50 plus. So your 50 plus voters are a little more knowledgeable on what the current law is for both. Uh, left hand side. This is the uh, majority of voters are unaware if marijuana businesses are operating in Hemet and the surrounding cities. Currently, there are multiple medical and recreational marijuana dispensaries illegally operating in Hemet. You're going to see for the next few slides, we're going to, these are questions, is this, act, is this statement accurate or inaccurate? And we're asking them, uh, and they'll give a response, very somewhat, somewhat inaccurate, it's very inaccurate. So there are multiple medical rec recreational medical uh, marijuana dispensaries illegally operating. Is that accurate? 29% said that was accurate. 20% say inaccurate. 50% have no idea. Okay. Another continuation of the confusion about um, in Hemet, marijuana businesses are legal in most of the cities surrounding Hemet. Accurate, 39 percent. Not very strongly. Not, not a, this is not a, a strongly held view. 29 percent inaccurate. 21 and 40 percent don't know. Again, same basic theme. A lot of confusion on this issue. Uh, potential marijuana legalization policies. Okay, um, this is kind of the, the, the central item of the survey. As you may know, 
city of Hemet does not allow any forms of marijuana businesses in the city, including growing, distributing, or selling marijuana medical or recreational purposes. Do you support allowing at least some kinds of marijuana businesses in Hemet, or are you opposed to allowing any kinds of marijuana businesses in the city? 50% said they would support. 31% strongly. Almost 50% said they oppose. 47%. This uh, the strongly opposed. You can see there's more intensity on the on the strongly opposed. Okay, but basically a 50-50 with a little more strength of, of on the oppose any any allow, any marijuana businesses to operate. Okay. Uh, if you said you support marijuana businesses operating. This is a, what we call an open-ended question. In a few of your own words, do you support or oppose why? So these are the 50% who said, I support. You can see basically here the taxes. This is generally the, uh, generally on the marijuana issue, whether you're supporting or you're opposing the use of marijuana to be legally sold, taxing is a, a pretty unifying force. You can oppose legalization of marijuana, but you're probably pretty uh, strongly supportive of taxing it. So taxing, because most of the cities need revenue, uh, especially if it is, again, legal. So if you're supported, it's a tax, right? We're going to tax it. It's revenue. It's going to benefit us. Um, it's for medical reasons. You're going to find, again, consistent. If you want to legalize, obviously these Respondents are referring to medical marijuana. We think medical marijuana should be available, and that's one of the reasons we support allowing marijuana in this city. We need it. helps people. It's good. So you have two, two basic. It brings in revenue, good for the economy, uh, and is needed by, by people. People get it. Okay? Medical reasons. Needed. Helps people. It's good. If you oppose it, um, you can see the 19% said, I oppose it because I connect it with crime and safety. Drugs, it's just another drug. Brings trouble, brings problems, attracts unwanted people. You can see the themes there. Not a good idea. Bad for teenagers, children. It's illegal, it shouldn't be legal. Relates to homeless in some, some way. Okay? Smells bad. Right? So those are the open-ended reasons, pretty pretty clear distinction on why your voters support it and oppose it. Uh, I, I showed you a couple of demographics here of this vote. So of the of the 50 to 47, I have each of your districts here with the percentage of sample of, that related to the number of voters who responded. So you can see most District 1, 2, and 3 Slightly supportive. District 1 is 59-41. Only one district, uh, District 4, that's on the on the no side. Five is even. I'd just like to point out, District 2 is actually Brown, and District 5 is Krupa. Great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, also, the same question, 50 to 47 overall, but this is, shows you by length of uh, how many years they've lived here. If you've been here zero to five years, there's not a great deal of difference here between new arrivals and if you've been here 21 plus years, which is 31% of your population, of your voters. 21% are zero to five. These are voters. Okay? Again, pretty thematically, pretty... Pretty similar to the 50-47 city split on a number of different, different demographics. If you think there was a great need for additional dollars that the city has a need for, which was 41%, those voters are supporting at 60 to 40. If you think there's little or no real need for dollars, you're opposing it literally at the same percentage. The opposite. So again, it relates to if voters think, and if you think there's some need, they're split. So these voters clearly want 
we want more services, could be public safety, num any number of other issues. Uh, different types of uh, marijuana businesses we also tested. Okay, this is, uh, this is probably the, the clearest uh, delineation between the medical marijuana and the recreation. So the question was, dispensaries that sell medical marijuana products recommended by doctor patients in order to treat illness, diseases and illness, do you support or oppose? 72% said they support the medical marijuana products. 53% strongly. So this is a strongly held view. Everybody has a view here. 2% didn't know, but everybody, uh, all 98% had a view. And clearly it was almost three quarters say yes to medical marijuana. Stores that sell marijuana products to adults over the age of 21 for recreational purposes, support or oppose? 53% oppose, 44% support. The intensity is all in the strongly opposed. There can't be a, a more clear distinction uh, on this basic issue for your voters. Okay. Uh, I put this up just to show you some demographics on this. This is a demographic group. So Latinos are 17% of the overall sample. On support for medical marijuana dispensaries, Latinos were 64% yes, I support. They are 24% for recreational marijuana. Okay, these are, these are, I did this on showing the difference with diff different demographics between the medical marijuana supporters and the recreational. So if you're 18 to 39, you're 81% for medical and you're 50 for recreational. You can see the, the younger voters, the differences are, are, are less, but here the, the 75 plus, 21% of your electorate in this sample are 75 plus, 53% of the sample are 65 plus. So 65 year olds, 71% yes to medical marijuana, only 39%, a 32% difference. So you can see the, the older voters, Latino voters, some of the women, women 18 to 49, probably 60% of these, these uh, voters have, have kids under 19 in their home. They are for medical marijuana. They are not for recreational. Okay? Just a demographic distinction. We also went through a number of uh, different types of businesses. This is... The, the blue is support, strongly support, some would support, some would oppose, strongly oppose. In red, so overall 63% supported labs that test marijuana and related products for safety and quality and do not sell directly to consumers. Do you support or oppose that type of business? 63% said they supported it, 41% strongly, almost two to one. Do you support or oppose cultivators that grow marijuana plants for sale to medical marijuana dispensaries? 57% support, 40% oppose. Intensity is about the same, but still almost 20% difference support or oppose. Businesses that transport marijuana goods between licensed cultivators, manufacturer, and distributors. We're getting a little closer to 50-50, but still 11-point margin. The intensity here is exactly the same. Businesses that manufacture marijuana products that do not sell directly to consumers, 47, 47, 35% strongly oppose, 28% strongly support. The last one, cultivators that grow marijuana plants for sale to stores that sell marijuana for recreational purposes or other businesses that make marijuana products, base products. Almost 50% no. Again, the intensity grows here when it's recreational. It's still pretty even. Okay? Taxation of marijuana businesses. 
Uh, again, we've, we've talked a little bit about uh, strong majorities view taxing marijuana businesses as appropriate and a way to raise meaningful amount of revenue for city services. Do you think it's accurate or inaccurate that taxing the marijuana businesses is an appropriate way for the city of Hemet to raise revenues for city services? 72%, 55% very accurate, only 20%. Right? Again, the basic theme, yes, can have marijuana businesses is an appropriate way. Taxing marijuana businesses in Hemet could raise a meaningful amount of revenue for city services, accurate or inaccurate. Almost three to one accurate. So that, that additional dollars is clearly going to help us. We, we could raise a significant amount of money directed to our city services. Okay, this is a question more likely, less likely. Okay, if allowing marijuana businesses in Hemet would generate a meaningful amount of funding for city services, would you be more likely to support allowing marijuana businesses less likely, or would you have no impact on your thinking? So this is 47% would be more likely to allow marijuana businesses to raise additional revenue, 25% or less likely in 24% no impact. Okay, again, if we can raise revenue, address it, and you see support is pretty consistent, no matter how we ask it. Okay, more support for taxation of recreational marijuana businesses than medical. If medical marijuana businesses are allowed in Hemet, do you think they should be subject to, and they were giving two options, the same business tax license as other businesses in Hemet, which was 56%, picked that option. 36% said an additional business license tax. Okay? If recreational marijuana businesses are allowed in Hemet, do you think they should be subject to almost the exact opposite? The same business license tax as other businesses, 39. 54% an additional business license. So tax them more. Another distinction between the medical marijuana and the recreation. Okay. If medical marijuana businesses are allowed in Hemet, do you think they should be subject to, the same options were given, the same business tax license as others, 56%? Only 36% said they should have an additional business license. Of those 36%, do you think the additional business license tax on the gross receipts of medical marijuana businesses should be, and we gave them some options, but almost, you know, 70, close to 80% said at least 10% to 15% higher. Okay, everybody with me on that? Same question, if recreational marijuana businesses are allowed in Hemet, do you think they should be subject to the same business license tax as others, 39, 54%, an additional. Among those 54%, do you think the additional business license tax should be, again, you see pretty much this is kind of the same percentages, almost, uh, you know, a good 70 plus, at least 10 to 15% higher than the initial business license tax. Same basic themes, difference between medical marijuana and recreational. Okay, regulations for marijuana businesses. Uh, this is uh, the first of a couple of slides, and I'm going to kind of go through these quickly. These are favor or pose, and we went through the regulations with the most support related to safety, security, and business keeping children away from keeping them away from children. We read them a number of different uh, regulations, and then the dark blue here is strongly favor. Somewhat favor, and the red is opposed. The dark red strongly opposed. You can see most all of these, there is no undecided or don't know. Voters are pretty clear about these. And unless you want me to, I'm not going to read each one of these. Requiring that operators and employees be subject to a criminal background check. 85 favorable, 9 opposed. Okay, 
can't get he can't get, get much un, more universal than that these days. Requiring dispensaries to provide security, including cameras, alarms, trained security guards, 85 to 8. Prohibiting the operation of marijuana business within 1,000 feet. I think the state law is 600, right? Um, 83 to 15. Using the revenue from marijuana business to tax, tax to maintain city services, including police, fire, paramedic services. This is 76 to 15. Again, the same thing we've, we've seen. Putting a limit on the hours of operation, 74 to 22. Prohibiting the operation businesses in any residential zone. See, these, these are all basically tougher regulations that voters. Okay, these start to drop a little bit, but still, almost all of these are two to one favorable. Evaluation of city staff and the police department. Dedicating all the revenue from Maryland tax to increase in local law enforcement. That's 67.29. The question we had earlier here, using the revenue for not just police and fire, but other uh, uses was 76%. When we just asked about public safety, it was still high, but a little higher the broader you make the money directed to other services. Operation of dispensaries within 1,000 feet, no alcohol, restricting operation of marijuana business to commercial industrial zones, setting a maximum number of square feet that can be used for marijuana businesses. All these are, again, just good, tough, solid regulations that prohibiting marijuana businesses who have previously operated illegally from applying. Favorable. I mean, in the growing or cultivation of marijuana for commercial purposes to warehouses and, or similar buildings. Again, almost two to one. Operation of dispensary within 1,000 feet of any other dispensary. Allowing medical marijuana dispensaries to deliver marijuana to homes and businesses. We're getting a little closer to that 50-50 supporter opposed any law changing. And the last one here. Limiting the growing of marijuana for personal use into indoors only. Pretty split. Maximum 250. That's split. Allowing the outdoor commercial cultivation of marijuana. Uh, we now move to the opposed side. Strongly opposed. 42%. Allowing recreational marijuana business to deliver marijuana to homes and businesses. Almost 60% opposed. Almost 50% strongly. Okay. Those are the run through of the regulations. Just kind of, I think I've hit most of these, these conclusions. Uh, voters are very confused about the current policies of marijuana businesses. Uh, they're evenly divided in their opinions of allowing at least some kind of marijuana businesses to be legal. Voters support medical marijuana dispensaries, but oppose recreational marijuana stores. Supporters believe medical marijuana should be an option for medical care and pain relief and could be an important source of revenue for the city. They want limits on where these businesses are located, how they run, who operates them on the regulation side. Uh, again, there's more support for using marijuana tax revenue for a variety of city services been dedicating all for law enforcement, but that was pretty close. That's a quick, quick run through. Any questions? Alan, you're supposed to always have questions. I'll ask a question. In your experience, how do you feel um, other cities have that have legalized marijuana, how has that helped with um, the illegal dispensaries? Because that's our problem. We, we've spent a lot of money, manpower, legal fees, fighting these legal dispensaries. So if we zone it and have some rules, does that squash some of that? Or what's your opinion no, on I'm that? Not, I'm not the best one to, I'm not as up to the, maybe somebody else has a better view of that. Um, most of the cities that have legalized, we just finished, uh, uh, a couple years ago, Santa Ana and worked in Los Angeles. Long Beach just did one in 2016. Uh, 
the electorates are, are quite different than yours. Right? So you you have 53%, as you saw, or over 65. You have uh, a lower uh, voters of color, um, and you have kind of a split Democrat-Republican. So there are some differences on the partisan side. You have 44% Republican, 36 Democrat, and generally speaking, Republicans are a little more opposed to it. Than, so your, your city is very unique, both in generationally, uh, partisan separations, and a uh, number of other Democrats. Most of the cities that are doing this are, are more Democratic uh, across the board and have, and have uh, larger populations of 18 to 39s, 18 to 49s. questions for John? I, I don't have a question for John, but I do have a question for um, Helen. Um, was there any community outreach uh, indicating that a survey would be coming down the road with regards to marijuana? And I ask that because I had several people contact me and ask about this survey because they didn't believe that it was from the city of Hemet. That the city of Hemet was, they just thought it was a arbitrarily, you know, a company that, that wants to know um, this information because they want to set up a dispensary or, or you know, a grow. Um, Not guilty of that. Pardon? Not guilty of that. <laughs> Well, I don't think so. But anyway, so um, I think perhaps some of it was skewed because of that, or perhaps some didn't. There were many that said to me that they just didn't even answer. They didn't even do anything because they were afraid that it was a scam. We, so, we, we did have a, an introductory letter that had the, the seal of Hemet on it that preceded the survey. That, I don't remember the exact and basically, this is an independent research. We're interested in your views on this issue. But it, there was a, a, a letter from... Not from us. From the, from the city that preceded this survey online. Oh, yeah, online, but not... Right. Okay, so we have a lot of so, the demographics. And usually we, we, we recommend that you don't do any prep, you don't do any publicity, you don't alert voters that something's coming. Because with the internet these days, immediately someone someone thinks a survey's coming, they're online and educating themselves, and we're looking for to give you a, a unbiased, uneducated, whatever they think at that particular point. Right. We're trying to give you a, a what is real out there as opposed to someone yeah, educating themselves and getting ready for the interview. I think come. there's always two sides to that. I think our senior demographic was probably a little bit more apprehensive um, and I do remember the letter from the city that went out but I think that um, uh, you know some of the sometimes these things you know I don't even know what the answer is because like you say you let them know and then there's there's issues with people trying to um, you, know, you know we had we had a tremendous response from your senior population yeah we had to wait back the number of interviews mm -hmm. to balance with the younger voters. We had, and again, I think that this, we, we are doing a lot of these kinds of surveys in, in cities, and voters want to talk about their local city. They want to weigh in on, and we literally had to wait back to make sure the 65, or the 75 plus was in balance with the 18 to 39, because we had such a good response from that, from your, your, your largest demographic And what I, what I don't remember is whether or not in the letter um, we indicated anything regard, with regards to what's legal in the city and what isn't, what isn't, what's legal and what is illegal. I don't believe we did. We did not give them yeah. any clue as to what is legal, illegal, nothing. Just that this is, this is city stamp. We're interested in your yeah. views. We didn't reference any lead to any question I, I believe whatsoever. That's mm -hmm. that's 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 pre prejudging and, yeah, and pre educating the that's respondents. True. Slippery slope. <laughs>
Yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's trying, difficult to, anyway, trying to get cold responses, so to speak. We're trying to get. Yeah. Uh, this is this is comes on someone's email, or you get a call. Yeah. Okay. If it's if it's about local issues, we 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 find the refusal rate for surveys in cities is one of the lowest we have on anything. It's one thing to call in for a candidate. Mm -hmm. It's another thing to call in and asking about city issues. And once the res once our interviewers get past the first couple first couple questions, gives a uh, a respondent a very clear sense of this is about my city. They're not trying to hustle me for something. They're not trying right. to sell me something. They're not or not pushing a, a certain side or on, on another. We find as soon as you get through the first two or three questions, again with your with your senior senior respondents. This is this was meant to be a 20-minute interview. Some of them took 30 minutes because they just wanted to talk yeah. and talk and talk about oh, yeah. <laughs> how they felt about the city. <laughs> John, I want to thank you for okay. the presentation and the time. My pleasure. We're running short on time, so we need to get to the next. Okay. Center. Oh yeah, that's right. Sorry. Good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. My name is Hita Mosesman. I'm a principal with RSG. Um, we are a municipal financial consulting firm. Uh, we were retained to conduct a fiscal and economic impact analysis on the potential for the allowance of cannabis-related businesses in the city. I wanted to start, uh, there are a lot of facts and figures and data points that we're going to throw out um, tonight to walk you through the report and how we prepared it. But I wanted to start with just our basic assumptions and the results um, and our findings. So in terms of the um, assumptions, uh, we looked at three different scenarios um, for uh, potential cannabis-related businesses in the city. We did this because Cannabis is a relatively new phenomenon, especially recreational cannabis, to the state of California. Um, data sources, uh, valid data sources, uh, tend to be uh, somewhat limited. We don't have a 10 or 20 year track record of taxation. So we wanted to look at several different scenarios to provide you with a range of what you could potentially expect in terms of uh, fiscal and economic impacts. So our first scenario, scenario A, um, did not include any dispensaries or any adult use outlets at all. Um, it only included um, 250,000 square feet maximum of other businesses such as cultivation and manufacturing. Our second scenario, scenario B, did include five medical dispensaries only, no adult use or recreational retail outlets, and a maximum of 500,000 square feet. Uh, total within the city. And then scenario uh, C, which is the, the least restrictive, least conservative scenario. Again, only five medical dispensaries, no adult use retail outlets, and no maximum square footage per se that we would leave that to be market driven. And here are the findings of our report sort of in a nutshell. Um, first, I'll cover the fiscal impacts. We looked, did a 10-year projection of revenues to the city and costs. So gross revenues minus costs equals net revenues to the city's general fund. So in the least restrictive of the scenario, or excuse me, the least, the most conservative of the scenarios, scenario A, the average annual net revenue to the city would be between 800,000 and 2.2 million a year. That's after costs were accounted for, and I will go through in detail what those costs are later in the presentation. Um, that same uh, scenario would generate approximately 117 to 344 jobs in the city of Hemet, and would uh, spur about 200 to 500 million dollars worth of economic output, which is basically the value of goods and services in the city of Hemet over a 10 year period. Scenario B, which is more of our midpoint, uh, the net revenues, the average net revenues to the city are between two and a half to six and a half million per year, 300 to close to 900 new jobs in the city, and economic output of almost 400 million to a little over $1 billion over 10 years. 
Scenario C, the least restrictive, 3.3 to 11.6 million net revenue to the general fund annually. 350 to 1,400 new jobs created in the city of Hemet. 500 million to 2 billion worth of economic output generated over 10 years. So by way of background, and I'm sure this is something that we all know, that Proposition 64 was passed um, in the state of California in 2016. Because this is such a recent phenomenon with um, really just six months worth of data and experience under our belt as a state, um, the existing and actual data for the state of California is extremely limited. However, there are other states in the West, such as Washington, Oregon, Nevada, um, and uh, Colorado that have legalized adult use uh, cannabis in recent years. So we have about one to three years of data from those other states. What we wanted to do when we were uh, coming up with assumptions to project revenue and economic impacts was to avoid using any data sources that came from the cannabis industry themselves. We feel that that is an impartial uh, third party independent data. So we looked to other data sources and the three that we primarily relied on for the study are University of California Agricultural's Issues Center study that was produced for the state of California on the impact of medical cannabis only. This study was published in uh, February of 2017. We used a lot of the information to project revenue and amount of product created and sold from this study that just covered medical and not adult use. We also used a study out of Colorado on the economic impacts of uh, legalized cannabis there. That study actually used two years of relevant data from 2014 to 2016, and the University of Colorado um, is involved in that study as well. And the third study we looked at was from the California State Legislative Analyst Office on their analysis of the economic impacts of Proposition 64, that study coming out in 2016. Just a couple of quick points, I don't want to take too much of your time here, um, to highlight that we have reviewed the, um, the legal regulations uh, through the state of California, and what we found is that those regulations are pretty strict. It's a very highly regulated industry. Um, all owners of any cannabis businesses must be identified no matter how small their ownership share is. There must be fingerprinting and background checks for the owners and the employees. And each of these businesses has to have a very thorough and comprehensive security plan, including cameras, alarms, et cetera. All cannabis businesses in the state have to do inventory every two weeks and keep very good records of that inventory. And there are very high standards in terms of um, how employees are retained and what kind of qualifications they have and what kind of background checks are conducted for those employees. And the state is allowed to conduct on-demand inspections at any time. Um, and they would go through all of those records, including the inventory, the background checks, et cetera. And another thing I think that was highlighted in the previous presentation, um, cannabis in California is a little bit confusing. It is legal on a statewide basis, but um, businesses have to obtain local approval from cities or counties before they can even apply for a state license. So cities really are the gatekeepers to the entire cannabis industry. The first step in our process of looking at um, economic and fiscal impacts was to look at what other cities in Riverside County had ballot measures to uh, legalize, in this case, adult use cannabis. And uh, as you probably are aware, Desert Hot Springs, San Jacinto, Paris, Cathedral City, and Coachella have all had these ballot measures, um, most of which in 2016. Uh, those cities do not have maximums on the number of businesses or the number of square feet um, in their cities. So in looking at our study, we had to come up with some assumptions of what tax rates, hypothetical tax rates could be um, uh, seen in Hemet, potentially. So in doing that, we looked at the tax rates of those other cities that I mentioned. And we came up with tax rates were, that were either on the low side of what those averages are um, or below. Um, to retain some type of um, competitive situation for the city of Hemet. I won't go through each individually, but you can see um, in terms of dispensaries, 
that's all based on the gross receipts of businesses. Those tend to be 10 to 15 percent um, throughout. And then in terms of cultivation and manufacturing, it's sort of all over the board. There's a wide range. And as you can see, some cities do not tax manufacturing uses, although they allow them. So we came up with some pretty conservative assumptions. Um, dispensaries, uh, medical only, 5 to 10 percent of gross receipts. For cultivation and manufacturing, both $6 at a starting point uh, per square foot with a maximum of $15 per square foot to allow flexibility. The next thing that we did in our process, our methodology, was to look at what type of revenues would be generated and how many square feet these businesses could potentially build and occupy. Um, again, these assumptions on the low end came directly from the University of California study that was specific to medical cannabis and not adult use cannabis. And then we applied, we applied inflators um, to increase those numbers for the ranges within each of the scenarios to account for a low, a midpoint, and a high range in terms of what could be sold and produced um, and occupied. But you can see in terms of pricing, retail prices under dis dispensaries and then uh, wholesale prices under cultivation, those prices are the same regardless of the scenarios. Those don't change. All that changes are the square footages that we assume for cultivation and manufacturing. So again, we came up with ranges under each scenario the low being the most conservative assumptions taken directly from the University of California study. The high range would be the most optimistic assumptions, um, and the medium would be the midpoint of the two. So we came up with the first step was the annual gross revenue to the city. So this is revenue, but costs have not been accounted for. And this shows you the low, medium, and high range under each scenario. So under scenario A, the gross revenues are anywhere from 1.4 to close to 3 million. Um, and this is annually, and this is an average over 10 years. Scenario B, it's anywhere from 3.3 to 7 million annually. Scenario C, it's 4.5 to almost 13 million annually. So our next step was to look at costs. Uh, because it is, it's understood that the city would incur some costs to um, enforce, provide regulation, to do inspections, um, and the like. So we worked closely with city staff to determine um, the staffing points and also the salary and benefit um, costs for each of those staffing points. So we assumed that there would be one to two new positions um, in this, for a city planner. Um, and starting with scenario A, that would be the one. Scenario two, C would be the two positions. And then the midpoint is halfway in between um, in terms of costs. And this would be for um, just dealing day to day with businesses, uh, reviewing pl security plans, um, and that, uh, those types of activities. Then we have city attorney costs. We did actually use um, as a starting point what your current costs are. We did take those into account for shutting down sort of the illegal dispensaries. Um, we did look at that information. But working with the city attorney, anywhere from 100000 to 200000 per year in additional costs um, with uh, legalization. Code enforcement, we assumed one to two new positions um, for code enforcement officers who are fielding uh, possible complaints or to do inspections of facilities. Police department, we assumed one to two new uniformed officers um, as a result of the legalization of cannabis. And then financial services, these are mostly um, probably due to security. The taxation on cannabis right now, um, because banking is, is challenging for the cannabis business, taxes are basically paid in cash. Um, so there has to be, as you can imagine, quite a bit of security on the days that these taxes come in to whatever designated spot they get paid. Um, so we're assuming that an independent security company would need to be hired to provide the safety and security for those tax payments. So as you can see, and these are first-year costs, 
were anywhere from 600,000 to almost 1.2 million annually. We applied inflators to these amounts each year, knowing that staff costs do increase over time. So this chart depicts what the average costs over the 10-year period are under each scenario. Again, they're very similar to the numbers I just said, 600,000 to 1.2 million annually. So that brings us to net revenue. So we take our gross revenue minus our costs, and this is what would be projected to go to the city's general fund after costs are taken care of. Under scenario A, it's anywhere from 800,000 to 2.2 million. Scenario B, 2.5 to 6.3 million. And scenario C, 3.3 to 11.6 million. This chart just summarizes, because I know we're, we're throwing out a lot of dollars and, and data points here. It just summarizes the net revenues, both annually, over five years, and over 10 years. I won't go through each box, uh, but maybe highlight the 10-year totals under scenario A, anywhere from 8 to 22 million. Under B, it's 25 to 62 million. And C, it's 33 to 116 million. So that's the total net revenues combined over 10 years. The second part of our report dealt with the economic impacts of cannabis businesses potentially in the city of Hemet. And for this, we use the in-plan economic model. It's really the industry gold standard of economic modeling. The University of California study used it, um, as well as a number of other studies that we reviewed. Um, Generally, in, in the area of economic analysis, this is what is, uh, is best practices. So the implant model looks at three different types of effects. The direct effect, which is the production and expenditures by the producers and consumers as a result of an activity or a policy. In this case, the potential for legalizing cannabis in the city. The indirect effect is the impacts of local industries buying goods and services from local, other local industries spurred by the economic activity of cannabis businesses. And the induced effect is really the respending of income that's generated from the economic activity. The first part that we looked at in the economic analysis was uh, the creation of new jobs. So this would be direct, indirect, and induced. So that means these are not just jobs that would be created by the cannabis industry. These are jobs that would be created by that industry plus all the other businesses that would serve that industry. And this is limited to just the city of Hemet. So this isn't regional. It's not countywide. This is just within the city limits. So under scenario A, it would be anywhere from 117 to 344 jobs. And these jobs would actually be created the first two years after all the businesses had opened. So it wouldn't take 10 years to generate the jobs. Under scenario B, it'd be 300 to almost 900 jobs. Scenario C, anywhere from 350 to upwards of 1,400 um, new jobs created. With regard to economic output, and again, that's the value of goods and services in the example, because I know that's kind of a vague term. Um, say that someone bought $100 worth of wood from a sawmill and then created from that wood a piece of furniture that they then sold for $300. The total economic output for that, for that uh, end product is $400. The $100 with the wood purchase, the $300 with the furniture purchase. So that's really what this represents here. So in terms of economic output for scenario A, 21 million to 57 million dollars, and this is over 10 years. Scenario B, it would be 42 million to 120 million. And then scenario C, again, the least uh, conservative, is 56 million to 227 million. And here, I won't go through this table, just uh, sort of to look at the jobs and the economic output side by side and, and together. And we are available to answer any questions that you might have. And if I could maybe quickly answer uh, Councilmember Meyer's question about how other cities are dealing with the cost of shutting down illegal dispensaries. Um, the cities that have legalized cannabis, either just medical or adult use and medical, 
are using the revenues from the tax taxes that they levy to help defer those costs um, that's really the plan that's happened the other thing that that we understand just from our research and talking with people in the industry is that um, once cannabis legal legitimate cannabis businesses move into a city they are very watchful for those illegal shops because they really don't want those illegal shops to be there it undercuts them it undercuts their bottom line so you almost have I don't want to say a partner because I, I don't know if I would go that far but what you have is a, another industry who's going to alert you and probably going to do whatever they can to assist in the shutting down of any illegal businesses any other questions? you mentioned that uh, there's state requirements that require uh, product inventories every two weeks and audits. And who actually enforces that? Would that be a, a representative of the state agency or would that be incumbent upon us to do through our code enforcement? It, it really it's the state unless you, through your ordinance, required that. Um, if you did not require that through the ordinance, a staff person going through the inventory records, then the city would not be responsible for doing that. And it might be duplicative because the state is, is already going to do that themselves. To, I'm sorry, to check the records. And they might not go every two weeks, but they will enforce the keeping of the records. seems mighty ambitious that the state would undertake that to to check inventories every two weeks. <coughs> but thank you for answering. Sure. <coughs> Any other questions? Thank you so much. So, Mayor and Council Members, now that we've stuffed you full of good facts and information, we've run out of time, really, for your study session, at least during your 6 o'clock hour. Uh, my presentation will take probably 10 to 15 minutes, and then we do need direction from you tonight, so you're going to have to have a substantive discussion because of the timing of everything. I'm more than welcome to get up and do my presentation now and go through with your discussion, or we can defer this until after your regular business meeting. It is your meeting. I'm happy to do your pleasure. What do you guys want to do? Keep going with this or come back to this after? Okay, so under normal circumstances, you'd be able to take all of this information, digest it over several months, have a number of public workshops, and then decide what you wanted to do, if anything. We're in a unique situation now. We have an election coming up in November, and on the ballot in November, we are going to have at least one, and still maybe two, private cannabis initiatives. I'm going to go through what those cannabis initiatives do and what they don't do uh, briefly, but I think enough to give you the flavor of what's, what's happening. So our situation today, as we sit here today, the city of Hemet has a complete ban on all commercial cannabis activities. I'm going to use that phrase over and over again because that's what the law uses to describe a whole variety of different types of legal cannabis activities, and that ranges from dispensaries to cultivation to manufacturing. Manufacturing.